walk the land where the heart's on fire and every step will be your friend hope is rising new day dawn sound of singing fills the air two thousand years and still the flame is burning bright across the land. Hearts are waiting, longing, aching for awakening once again. Let the flame burn brighter in the heart of the darkness, turning now to the glorious day. Let the song grow louder as the love grows stronger. Let it shine. Let it shine. We'll walk for truth. Reach out for love. In Jesus' name, we shall be strong. Lift the fallen, save the children, in this nation, with your song, two thousand years, and still the flame, is burning bright, across the land, hearts are waiting, longing Flame burn brighter in the heart of the dark, turning now to the glorious day. Let the song grow louder as the love grows stronger. Let it shine. Let it shine. One more song. Okay, let me see what's there. Chetta, number where is screen? I got in there. You are not seeing this. Oh, I don't know that. Let me see. Share screen. Is that like another? I put carte. Carte. All right. Oh, I don't know, man. Sorry, yeah. So you guys didn't, weren't able to sing the song, I guess. Okay. Bye. 
my flesh like fade away. Make me like a precious stone. Crystal clear and finely old. Most gracious and heavenly Father, thank you, Father, for this uh, time of worship and this time of Bible study. Abba, uh, I pray for Mancharni. Uh, Father, uh, speak to us through him. Let every word he speaks be a blessing to each one of us. Uh, let, his gu- let it guide us and uh, lead us in the week to come. Uh, Abba, I pray for Mancharni's family. Uh, let, let them continue to work for your glory, Shabbat. I pray for each and everyone who are here, Reshapa. You know each and every one of our hearts. Father, uh, shine your light uh, on us, Reshapa, and guide us. Uh, I ask these in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Okay. So, good evening and welcome to all those who joined. Right. Let's head over to the study of Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 4. For those who joined us late, we were going through, we are going through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. We call it the foundation of our faith. We call it the foundation of our faith. Things that are covered in the rest of the Bible, it all begins in these 11 chapters. The origin of things the origin of genealogies, the origin of God's curse, the origin of sin, uh, or origin of uh, you know, uh, temptation, all those things has its origin stories in these first 11 chapters of Genesis. Okay? So if you want to know what is the main themes of the Bible, it's all there in the 11 chapters, the first 11 chapters of the Bible. And we are going through it little by little, uh, step by step, so that we can get a good glimpse, good grasp of what is the basics of our faith. So thank you for joining us. And uh, last week, what we did was the life of Cain and Abel. We saw first creation, and then we saw uh, God assigning Eden uh, to Adam and Eve. Then we saw the first family. And then we saw how temptation came in through the form of the serpent. And then uh, how man fell and the curse came from all mankind. And then uh, first the serpent also. And then afterwards we see how it all became, you know, uh, irreparable. And uh, man and woman were sent out of the Garden of Eden. But then we also saw that the woman expected her son to be the promised Messiah. And how they uh, named him, he's the man. But then uh, after he was born, they found out he's not the man. So they they were so unhappy with their uh, existence that they named their son uh, Abel. Which shows that he is not, uh, life is not as it seems. You know, there is no going back to that kind of life again. Right? What they enjoyed inside Eden could not be recreated. Now we're going to look at the descendants of mankind. Okay, that's what we are focused on. So last time we saw a few things about uh, Cain. Uh, and we saw, we saw a few things about uh, Abel. We saw how they brought the sacrifice. And we saw how Cain, in spite of the warning that he received from God, killed Abel. And we also saw uh, you know, how he tried to defend himself. He, he tried to blame God. He tried to uh, you know, uh, wash away all the responsibilities that he had. But God kept on calling Cain. He wanted to know, you know, uh, yeah, I, I always have this uh, you know, 
this doubt about why does the bible say that the blood of abel speaks a better word you know in the book of hebrews chapter 11 if you turn with me to the book of hebrews chapter 11 the question comes there uh, hebrews chapter 11 hebrews chapter 11 padinonam adhyayam we will find it in verse 4 by faith abel offered to god a more acceptable sacrifice than cain through which he was commended as righteous god commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith though he is though he died he still speaks though he died he still speaks how can a dead man speak that's a question how does abel speak even today that was a question you know i wanted to ask myself as i read this passage in hebrews okay ആബേൽ മരിച്ചു മരിച്ചു കഴിഞ്ഞ ആബേൽ എങ്ങനെയാണ് സംസാരിക്കുന്നത് where the first you see abel is mentioned first and he is mentioned as being the person who brought a more acceptable sacrifice more acceptable sacrifice okay so what does the blood of abel or what does abel still speak abel speaks to us about faith see he is the first human to develop this excellent quality called faith his faith must have been so powerful that god by means of his spirit inspired paul to write this or whoever wrote the book of hebrews okay, to write this uh, about him and said record it that abel's faith was a tremendous faith it was a tremendous faith so we have to imitate abel's faith that's what he's saying there so what did able do because of his faith a, a better sacrifice he brought god he offered to god a better sacrifice so we who claim to be godly must offer a better sacrifice what do you mean by better qualitatively the sacrifice was better qualitatively he bought the best portions of the fat the first born of the lot he brought it as an offering unto god so god gets the best god gets the qualitative best from our life so that brings him glory that brings him joy that accepts that makes him accept our faith you see so here is abel bringing a better sacrifice then he says he was commended as righteous abel proved his righteousness by his better sacrifice you see james says show me your faith in action you see what action this righteous action is what is required from us whatever is right whatever is true whatever is noble whatever is holy when you do it then your faith is in action you see so abel brought a better sacrifice through his action he proved he, he was commended as righteous you see he was commended as righteous so what a great action that must be he proved his faith through his action god commending him by accepting his gifts and through his faith though he died he still speaks to him. so god accepted his gifts a righteous man offering his gifts to god it pleased god offering your gifts in the right manner offering your gifts to the right person offering your gift with the right attitude that is what abel signifies and god says i accept it i accept it how do we bring our offerings to god you know how do we bring our worship to god these are all important questions right people who are some churches they worship by dancing you know some play churches they just close their eyes stand where they are or bow down and you know they just stand where you are speak the words and worship the person who is speaking the words and standing in that position may be thinking about next week all the deadlines that he has at the office and things like that his heart may not be in the worship but the person who is dancing in the aisles 
he must be lifting his hands and worshiping god god accepts that god rejects the other why the heart is maybe the other way the person who is standing where he is and kneeling down and praying he might be focused on god truly from his heart he may be repent truly from his heart he may be worshiping god whereas the person who is dancing in the aisle might be just enjoying the music having a good time working out you know could also be there both ways is possible because god looks at the heart he knows he knows you can't be hidden from him so would you accept your worship that's the question would you accept your worship or would you would your offering be rejected just like how cain's was rejected okay so that is a question that we have to ask as we read this passage now let's look let's go into the genealogy part okay. cain knew his wife chapter 4 of genesis verse 17 onwards cain knew his wife and she conceived and bore enoch when he built a city he called the name of the city after the name of his son enoch to enoch was born irad and irad fathered mehujael and mehujael fathered methuselah chael and methuselah fathered lamech and lamech took two wives the name of the one was ada and the name of the other zilla ada bore jabal he was the first of those who dwell in tents and in their livestock his brother's name was jubal he is the father of all those who play the lyre and pipe zilla also bore tubal cain who was the forger of all instruments of bronze the sister of tubal cain was nama lamech said to his wives ada and zilla hear my voice you wives of lamech listen to what i say I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth, for he said, "God has appointed for me another offspring instead of Abel." For Cain killed him. So to Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. Okay. the name of the lord okay <clears throat> now genesis 4 17 onwards and 5 um, you know also ch- chapter 5 up to verse 32 there are uh, the first of uh, first two genealogies i mentioned there cain's genealogy and seth's genealogy i mentioned there okay now all these genealogies are not of the same types and of the same purpose okay there are two kinds of genealogies that we find what are they uh, in genesis we find um, uh, genealogies which are um, uh, what do you call it uh, in in a certain passage it is important to know that the genealogies are linear okay what do you mean by linear linear means uh, uh, just father son father son it will be mentioned like that okay or the second one is called segmented linear and segmented what does segmented mean segmented means uh, it is a fluid genealogy okay fluid genealogy they can change in order to reflect contemporary um, social and political realities okay they can change uh, they can skip generations uh, the, see the purpose for these ge- genealogies is not to create historical accuracy it is for uh, it is not for historical records rega inna ipo nammal government office lokku poyittu nammal aadharathinu kezhudum parayum inna aalde magande magalde magan ennokku parayum nammal bayangara detail aayittu kodukku inna varshathil inna kolla varsham ithu malayalam varsham ithu ingane sambhavam cheyidu okay so this is recorded in his name paaranannu kaanikkanayittu you have to go back two or three generations and tell all the parents names and all that but here the purpose is not historical okay it is not historical what is this it is actually created for religious purposes or for uh, uh, what do you call it domestic purposes okay ed samudaya ed tribal nanana ennu kaanikkan vendiyana main item in genealogies kaanjirukku see so the historical information preserved in the genealogy it is only accidental or you can say incidental okay adu angane regapettu povunnaan allada that is not history it is not to you know provide historical accuracy kanikkan vendi alla the genealogies koduthirikkunu okay so you might find uh, some generations are skip uh, grandfather and magane chalpam ayalde magan aayittu thane kondu okay grandfather and kochu magane chalpam sonda magan aayittu kondu so that kind of skipping of generations do happen in these genealogies 
but it is not uh, what do you say it is not trying to mislead us it is not trying to give us false facts it's actually it was the custom appuppane appanayittu consider cheyunnundaru allengil ammayappane appanayittu consider cheyunnu samuham undayirunnu so if the uh, father has um, uh, daughters the son in law may be mentioned as the son also you know like in the case of uh, jesus's uh, biblical genealogy records okay so showing that you know uh, sometimes the daughter is skipped and the husband of the daughter is taken as the son by the father okay so that also is is there why right? because it is mainly to show the domestic uh, you know lineage and is also uh, to give us a religious background of what the promises of god how they it was fulfilled through those generations okay so if the history is mentioned or historical accuracy is maintained it is only by accident or you can say it is incidental okay ingane aayi poyadal allade venam nuchu cheyadal okay now uh, why should i mention that because you know sometimes uh, uh, arguments can come based on the lineage or genealogy ayal achana avade ingane koduthirikkum ivide ingane koduthirikkum adinda angane nee vekkumbo this is the reason okay sometimes it could be some family member only um, but uh, slight difference okay slight difference might be there uh, uh, the person mentioned before might be the grandfather or the father in law you have to just make sure who is who before we make some kind of an assessment like that okay now the present passage shows two genealogies one of cain one of um, seth hmm? <coughs> yes uh, cain and seth now uh how did cain get his wife you know, that's a question many people ask us why where did cain get his uh, you know uh, wife from the bible says clearly that cain did find a wife because verse 17 starts with cain knew his wife so annatha kalathu innatha kalathu polulla thanne oru manushan കൂടുതൽ വർഷം ജീവിക്കും തോറും അയാൾക്ക് കൂടുതൽ കുട്ടികളുണ്ട് ഡെഫിനറ്റ്ലി ആഡം ഹാഡ് മെനി മോർ ചിൽഡ്രൻ ഓൺലി എ ഫ്യൂ ആർ മെൻഷൻ ഹിയർ ബട്ട് കെയിൻ വുഡ് ഹാവ് ഹാഡ് മെനി സോറി കെയിൻ വുഡ് ഹാവ് മെനി ചിൽഡ്രൻ ആഡം വുഡ് ഹാഡ് മോർ ചിൽഡ്രൻ സോ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് സെഡ് യു നോ വേഴ്സ് ട്വന്റി ഫൈവ് ഇറ്റ് സെൽഫ് ആഡം ന്യൂ ഹിസ് വൈഫ് ആൻഡ് ഷി ബോർ എ സൺ കോൾഡ് ഇം സെത്ത് ഇൻ ഇൻ പ്ലേസ് ഓഫ് ഏബിൾ ഷി ഗോട്ട് സെത്ത് uh then uh, verse 3 of chapter 5 when adam had lived 130 years he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him seth the days of adam after he fathered seth were 800 years and he had other sons and daughters all are not mentioned in the bible you see so he had he lived for 800 years man how many children in that so he had other sons and daughters so where did the initial men find their wives among their sisters now why wouldn't you not call that incest because the law had not yet been given the only law that had been given right now is the command to multiply and fill the earth which man received in chapter 2 uh, and chapter 1 the ending of chapter 1 also you will find that uh, um, you know he says go and populate go and multiply so here is a command given directly by god to go and multiply and how do we how does he plan to achieve that generally speaking they were allowed to marry within the family marriage was taking place among brothers and sisters why because the law had not yet been given after the law had been given it was not allowed see so the problem of abraham marrying his own family member uh, you know and sarah that is also solved why because it is not it was not condemned it was not prohibited at that time the gene pool was not corrupt also so there was no danger in marrying a near of kin so, but as it came on as it became later and later the gene pool got corrupted and people who are close to the family if you marry together you might have an offspring who is deformed so god brought this law in to say that that is not possible so, so here is god being gracious he allowed this to happen why because he he wanted man to keep the commandment of populating the whole world okay so uh, let's look at how to explain this genealogy the cain's genealogy first okay but we are first following cain's genealogy uh, just like how his birth was announced to the world okay uh, like adam knew his wife 
same way, Cain knew his wife. Means again, intimately, in a physical way, the sexual relationship is highlighted. Now, this birth gives no recognition of God's connection to the gift of a child. In contrast to Eve, at the time of the birth of Cain, chapter 4, verse 1, you know, there was a declaration that I have gotten. And later at the birth of Seth, chapter 4, verse 25, there is a problem. God has appointed for me. So, interestingly, this birth of Cain's child, when he bore Enoch, does not have, come with any promises attached to it. Any conditions attached to it, any blessing attached to it. So, Cain is the first city builder. He built a city and named it after his son, Enoch. So, what does that mean? He being a city builder. See, Cain, with the first city, he makes, uh, you know, uh, he makes a comment on cities. Cain's punishment was that he would be a wanderer. And here he's taking the steps to create for himself permanent resident places in other places. See? He goes on building cities. He's taking the first step for himself and others to have some permanent dwelling places. So he's trying to resist God's punishment. So it could be sinful. But it's also identifying Cain as the first city builder. The passage makes it clear that the, the nature of the cities are under observation. They are potentially dangerous, right? Because the individual sinners are the problem, you see. What happens when sinners get together? More sin. More sin. The intensity and the problem of sin increases. Sin doesn't get solved in cities. Sin multiplies in cities. So, so that doesn't mean that cities are all evil. No. But the chances for sin to grow is exponentially greater in cities. Secondly, Cain builds a city. Uh, and uh, he called the name Enoch. In uh, I think it is dedicated to his son. So, where did all the people come into the city? Cain is actually the second generation of humanity. So, uh, the cities are not going to be big or thoroughly populated. Okay? But we are talking about a sizable population moving into the cities. So, other people means their children, their children's children, other people's children, like Seth's children, other children of Adam and Eve, they all moved into Cain's city. So this could be one of the fundamental places where people congregated by, they all were descendants of the same Adam and Eve, but now it took so much time, you see, 800 years Adam lived. So imagine how many years, it would, maybe 200 years? For the first city to come out, okay, but we know that it was dense, getting densely populated. Okay, so verse eighteen onwards, it starts moving very fast through the genealogy. Okay, we'll find uh, three generations: Enoch, Enoch, then comes Irad, then comes Mehujael, and then comes Methushael. Okay, then comes to Lamech. Now, see, Lamech is the first polygamous person, right? He's the first poly, he, he had two wives. And he's proud of having two wives. Not only that, he's proud of some other things. Also. What is that? Uh, he bore, uh, one, one lady gave him uh, one child, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. So, so raising and uh, selling a sheep and, you know, all those things, uh, animals, livestock. That was Credited to Lamech. Okay. So Lamech was a businessman, a genius in that sense, in that generation. Right? So polygamy does not give him any spectacular thing. It actually ma makes him a mean person. You know? uh, because later on in the law of Moses, it is regulated. So, but why would God allow polygamy? Now There are two reasons why God would allow polygamy. In those days, the men were dominant in the society and the women were ignored. So for the woman to get an equal opportunity in society or to get a livelihood, it was almost impossible. 
So having a husband to take care of her would solve this problem, mainly the problem of survival and hunger, protection to a great extent for a woman. She would be known as somebody's wife means other people would dare touch her and people would give her respect. People, uh, she would have a, a reliable livelihood and because of that, polygamy was not uh, you know, allowed by God. By what allowed by God. It was not it was not God's plan. God's plan was one man, one wife. But here is man going against it. But in a way, it in a male-focused society, it gave protection and survival benefits for the woman. And for 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 her, God showed grace. And this was actually, but it had to be regulated in some way. So it was regulated later on in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, you will find. Verse 7 to 11, Exodus chapter 21. Exodus 21, verses 7 to 11. When a man sells his daughter as a slave, she shall not go out as the male slaves do. If she does not please her master who has designated her for himself, then he shall let her be redeemed. He shall have no right to sell her to a foreign people since he had broken faith with her. If he designates her for a son, he shall deal with her as with a daughter. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing or her marital rights. And if he does not do these three things for her, she shall go out for nothing without payment of money. See, God made a protective covering for woman so that she would not be abandoned. She would not be left to you know, uh, fend for herself. She would be given protection and she would be given honor. That is what God's concern was. See, so God regulated uh, polygamy. God regulated misuse and abuse of women. Okay, so Lamech is the first polygamous man. Okay. He's the first person described in the Bible as such. Uh, marriage as instituted by God, I would say it again, as instituted by God was monogamous, which means one person one wife. The two shall become one flesh, says Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Polygamy emerges in the Cain's line, you see. So it's an implicit critique of that practice. The despicable character of Lamech, that is what that passage actually highlights. Okay. Again, Lamech's character comes out very clearly in the boasting that he shows, he tells to his wives. What is that? He says, uh, I, I'm the one who takes vengeance, you see. I'm the one who takes, but how does he take vengeance? He takes unjust vengeance. God had to regulate this also later on, you know, when God said in Exodus chapter 21, again, 24 and 25, God had to say uh, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a hand for a hand, foot for a foot. You can't take more than what that person has taken. See, if somebody gouges out somebody's eye, the people are enraged. They will demand the life. So they would not stop at anything but the life of that man who took the eye out. You see? So God was regulating that revenge mentality and saying, you can only take an eye for an eye. That is again God's grace. God permitted the eye to be taken for an eye so that the, they won't take more than that. Because people who have suffered the loss would demand more than what has been lost. So to avoid that, God had to regulate this revenge mentality that is in man. God also offered places of uh, uh, you know, refuge so that people who are you know who have accidentally murdered others can go and Wait, nobody can harm them in those places of refuge. Why? Till they present their case. God ordained these places of refuge also. See? So, uh, Cain would be avenged sevenfold, God says, so that Cain would not be taken revenge upon. But Lamech says, I take it 70. He says 77 fold. So he's an unjust man who would take revenge in an unjust way. Okay. So people, what what the, what the narrator is trying to show is that people are not getting better. 
they are getting worse and worse if cain was bad his successors were worse and the worst among the lot could be lamech that is what the progression is towards okay appo samuham undai patanangal undai aalkar avada thamasam thodangi so there was a, a bad change or a change towards the negative in the in the character of man that is what the narrator is trying to point towards but of course there were great um, you know uh, development then there was great growth there was great inventions you will find um, you know the liar and the pipe uh, people who are musicians all came in that line see? so what does it show the wicked line of cain they had all these great things they were inventors they were people who were creative but understand that all this does not make man a better person inventions discoveries advancement in technology does not make man a better person education does not make man a better person it just makes him a learned thief an efficient murderer it just makes him more calculative more vengeful so there is no progress only thing is all these things are in, in, in increased but man's condition character has not improved it has become worse see so uh, you can see cultural development you can see all kinds of uh, you know farming and uh, livestock production all those things good things okay. so uh, civilization has improved but the character of man the nature of man has declined now let's look at um, uh, okay one more thing we, we would like to finish up here in cain we see the builder okay god god's word kept uh, protected cain and uh, he has now been a wanderer okay uh, the word um, uh, nod that you will find uh, in the next uh, chapter i think yeah uh, that uh, means wandering okay now man is a wanderer he wants to settle down man see he wants to settle down in the cities that's why he built the city so uh, as a farmer or when cain could not get anything why because the land is cursed to him so cain could labor and uh, nothing would be yielded by the farm so he built a city and the city would provide something for him see so cain never stopped being a fugitive he was always wandering so the land where he settled the nod means wander the land of nod was 16 the land of nod means wanderer so he was a wanderer his citizenship was not in heaven so he had no hope on reaching the heavenly city the only city that cain knew was here on earth so uh cain's wife bore him a son his son's name is enoch enoch means consecrated the word enoch means consecrated and the city is also named consecrated consecrated means dedicated to or being belonging to now it does not tell us to whom this person belongs to or to whom the city is dedicated to so some of these people are famous and they all live in the city but the city is not dedicated to god definitely the sun is not dedicated to god okay. he is consecrated but for whom we don't know okay so we see that there is a lot of uh, mystery regarding this first civilization but we understand that these men whom are mentioned in the city they have a very strange resemblance in their names to the descendants of seth also see Seth's son was called Enosh. Here it's called Enoch. There it's called Enosh. Okay, and then if you look at the descendants of Seth, you'll find a very similar names are mentioned there also. Uh, in, uh, verse seven of chapter five, Enosh eight hundred and seven years and had other sons. Thus, all the days of Seth were nine hundred twelve after he died. Enosh lived ninety years. His father's Canaan. Enosh lived after his father Canaan eight hundred fifty days. Canaan lived and his father Mahalel. Parallel is Mahu Mehu Jael and Mahalel. Kenan lived and he fathered Mahalel. When Mahalel lived, eight sixty-five, he fathered Jared. 
Mahalil again had Methusa. Okay, keeps on going like that. Okay, Jared lived and he had Enoch, the real Enoch, who walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. All these names seem like a parallel of the Methushael and Methuselah. So parallels maybe, but why these are common names during those times? Okay, so it could be a very popular cultural thing. But what we understand could also be that when you put these two family trees close by, you can't help but see the similarity between the two trees. Okay. What does that mean? Maybe it's God's way of telling us that the godless line of Cain, which is still with us, it tries to imitate the godly line of Seth. Satan is a counterfeiter. See, he imitates names of true believers, but he can't produce true believers. See? Seth's line had many believers, and that is only possible by God. But Satan can try to duplicate believers' names, but he can't produce believers. See? There is an Enoch in both genealogies, but Cain's Enoch did not walk with God and one day disappear and go to heaven. What's in a name? Nothing is there in a name. If you don't belong to the Lord, there is no, even you can put the best name for your children. But if the child does not belong to God, if the child does not believe in Jesus Christ, if he is not born again, then there is no point in this. So your name can mean the best. You know, I, I've seen people whose name is uh, Jonathan, whose name is you know, gift of God, grace of God, all those names. We have seen biblical names put for children. But if that person does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, the name is no use. The name is no use. It's a tragedy. Okay. Now, another tragedy is there. Tragedy is that these two lines, the ungodly line of Cain and the godly line of Seth, they came together and they merged in chapter 6. Okay. Verse 1 and 2. When man began to multiply on the face of of the land and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive and they took as their wives any that they chose. Okay. It was merging also. Okay. Ungodly line and the godly line. So a wicked society was formed, born after that. Whose sins brought on what? The judgment of the flood. Lamech's brand of violence was spreading. Chapter 5, again, verse 11 and 12 says that, you know, thus all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. And uh, sorry, uh, I think it is um, verse 5. 6, verse 5 says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So evil increased by the time the flood came. Cain's family tree ends with the family of Lamech. Arrogant murderer, three sons manufactured things for this world, polygamy, all those things, Namek. The world at that point of time maybe admired Cain's achievements. It admired Cain's descendants, but God wiped them off the face of the earth. Okay? God wiped them off from the face of the earth. But the line of Seth still continues, still lives. The world, it says in 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 17, and the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. It doesn't matter what you have invented. It doesn't matter what you have, what cultural developments you've got. It doesn't matter what all uh, achievements you have in your life, how many degrees you have got. It doesn't matter. What finally matters is the world and everything that is in it is passing away. But if you do the will of God, you will abide forever. That is what God's promise is. People who does the will of God, a person who does the will of God, he will abide forever, the word of God says. What is the will of God? The will of God is that you be saved. Will of God is that you be sanctified. You live a holy life. Will of God is that you share the goodness that God has blessed you with your neighbors. Share salvation with others. The will of God is that you 
would worship the true and living God. Be thankful to him all the days of, his, of your life and you will be productive in your Christian walk. This is what God wants us to do. Be saved, live a holy life, share your goodness with others, worship the true and living God, thanking him all the days of your life. This is what God intends for us. He who does the will of God abides forever. The world is passing away and the lust of it is also fading. But he who does the will of God says 1 John chapter 2 verse 17. He will live forever. Chain slime, no matter how great they were, wiped off. Set slime, continue. Help us to see, O Lord, that the days are evil and those who are righteous, called by God, have a calling to fulfill. We have a testimony to this world. We have to witness to this world. That is why we have been left here. So let us be thankful to God for our generation. We are here in this generation for a purpose. When we do the will of God, we will abide forever. Shall we pray? Gracious and loving Father, we saw the genealogies of these men, men of the Bible, how they got their wives, how they settled down, how they were boasting of their achievements, how they were instrumental in development of life here on earth. But Father, every one of them who did not do your will were wiped off from the face of the earth. They did not receive eternal blessings. They were completely lost. Their name was great, but they did not have a relationship with you. And we thank God, thank God for the relationship that the people of Seth, the line of Seth had with you. Many people like Enoch, who walked with God and was no more. Bible stops to record all these achievements, all these men, and especially the men who had relationship with God. And God blessed them. God blessed them. And God blessed them. Those who had relationship with God lived forever. Those who had relationship with the world and with other people here on earth, their lives got over here on earth. They died and their lives were over. Father, I pray that you'll be able to see the contrast in this. Help us to see the value of obeying your will, value of living according to your purposes. We give you all thanks. We give you all praise. You're a God who is gracious and merciful to even murderers like Cain. And you show mercy to us. You show grace towards us. You forgive our sins. You still give us chance after chance after chance to get back to you, have a relationship with you. What gain is it if a man gains the whole world, but he loses his own soul, the Bible says. Help us not to lose our sins, but to find you, the greatest treasure, in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.